Morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Excellent. So my name is Henrik Cox. Um, we're going to talk to you today. You've heard a lot about what Blueprint is so far. So now during this orientation, we can take you into a little bit more of the finer details of the logistics and what you guys will be submitting by the end of today. But before we do that, we have another introduction video uh, to show you. And just like yesterday evening, it's from the United Kingdom. And Without further ado, I'll introduce to you Mr. Will Travers, of, President of the Born Free Foundation. Hi, Henrik. I'm Will Travers, President of the Born Free Foundation. I'm really excited about your plans for conservation and the Blueprint Conference. Goodness knows, we need some really fresh thinking in the conservation world because most of the things that have been tried in the last 50 years have, at best, merely slowed the rate of destruction and devastation, but rarely halted or reversed it. Similarly, the speed with which we're losing species is, frankly, frightening. Furthermore, we must not only consider where we are at this point in time, but try to come to terms with the human impact we will have on the natural world in just a few short decades, the span of a human lifetime, by which time there will be almost certainly an additional four billion people on this planet three quarters of whom will be found in Africa. Based on that statistic alone, we must ask one simple question. Will there still be space for wildlife at all by 2100? I believe the answer simply must be yes for any number of reasons, biological, environmental, cultural, aesthetic, and moral. So, how shall we achieve this? Well, we're gonna have to be a lot smarter than we've been to date. We'll need innovation, commitment, common sense, cash, and an ability to moderate our own desires, our rapacious and relentless growth. That's where you and your colleagues and friends at Duke Conservation Tech come in. With minds not yet cluttered with the detritus of life, with unfettered ambitions to bring about positive change, you may hold the key, or more likely, a bunch of keys. I have over 30 years experience. I'd be delighted if there was some way I could contribute to your mission. So, what do you want me to do? Sadly, my schedule doesn't permit me to participate in person at this Blueprint Conference, but in the future, I'd be happy to meet up at Duke, come and sit in for a couple of days. The need for compassionate conservation solutions has never been more urgent. So, good luck, dream the impossible, think the unbelievable, and let us know how you get on. With best wishes from me and everyone here at Born Free. Huge thank you to uh, Mr. Travis and everyone that took part in making that video at the Born Free Foundation. So, let's get on to what is important of the day. <laughs> so, lunch is fully catered, starts at 12.30, goes on for about an hour, uh, during which we'll have a guest speaker, Professor Von Windheim, speak to you about communicating your ideas more effectively when you're going to pitch your blueprints later on in the day. And then, throughout the entire day, there'll be a snack room where you can pop in and out at your pleasure. And your blueprints will be judged based on five criteria, the first of which is creativity. Simple enough, how does your idea, how is your idea fresh and innovative and original compared to what's out there currently? The second of which is implementation. Have you thought of an activation plan? Do you know how you could execute your blueprint and make an idea, turn an idea into reality? Which leads on to scale, how vast can you grow your project? What communities can you affect? And we're looking for ideas that will spread quite vastly, essentially. Next is inspiration. <coughs> How will future groups continue your work? How will they improve on your solutions? And how, does your idea, how do your ideas teach and raise awareness whilst also doing good? And finally, last but not least, we're looking for radical ideas that no one has stopped to think about yet. We don't, we're not looking for ideas that are ridiculous, impossible feats, but we are looking for ideas with a genius to it that slowly reveals itself the more you think about it. These ideas, call it a hunch, call it a gut feeling, are so crazy, they might just work. So finally, your submissions. We're gonna be looking for you to submit PowerPoint presentations about Three, three slides or so, 
Um, but we don't want to limit you in how you want to present your blueprints. So if you want to write a report, write that report, but please present it in a PowerPoint style. If you're going to make a video, please embed it via YouTube link or embed it into the PowerPoint and then present that later on in the afternoon. If you want to make a computer or software drawing or model, please do that, take screenshots, take screen recordings, whatever you want to do, and then embed that into the PowerPoint presentation. If there are any other ways that you guys want to make your blueprints and don't know how to embed it into a PowerPoint, essentially, come chat with us, and we want to be as accommodating as possible for you guys. So before we have you all split up into your teams and form your teams and get you off into your team rooms, I want to introduce you to Kimberly Marchant from the WWF Science, um, and here to talk to you about how conferences like these have been occurring and how successful they are and what can come out of them. And she just wants to talk to you about the previous examples that have really come out and how successful these things can be. So thank you to Kimberly. Um, Thanks, Henry. Did we catch that? Perfect. No problem. Hi, I'm Kimberly. So I'm with WWF um, with our science team, which is actually, I'm based in Washington, D.C., but we're a global science team serving um, all of our country offices. I'm also a Nicholas alum, um, and so I'm really happy to be back here um, talking to you because this is very real. I'm inspired that you're all here talking about this. When I was here, we weren't really talking about delivering solutions in quite this way. We knew the scale of the problem. This has been set up for you already. But we weren't really talking about how rapid we've got to get these ideas out into the world. And so um, we find it really inspiring. And just to ground truth the fact that our colleagues right now, most of my wildlife and tech colleagues are in San Francisco in the Bay Area this weekend at a tech fair. And we're doing that with Google. And we've got our friends at IDEO. And so they're all out there right now talking about um, the show showcasing some of the solutions that we've been devising with partners, with government, with um, private sector folks to really tackle um, really sticky problems. And it goes from everything from um, UAVs, also sensor technologies, um, thermal cameras, um, all the way to machine learning um, for really looking at a whole value chain for fisheries. So a whole host of issues. But what I thought I would do is give you just a little bit of a taste for how WWF looks at innovation within our practice across all of our different areas of focus and walk you through some of the phases and steps that we do, whether or not we're doing it in a room in Washington with inviting colleagues or whether we're doing it at a large conference or taking four to five months to really get to the, the, the root cause of an issue to then jump to an idea. And really, we're looking at right taking not really understanding what that problem is that you have in front of you and some of those ideas, looping it through some cycles to get to some concepts. And then as you've talked about, really going on to testing, um, experimenting with it, getting it out on the ground, launching it. If it's working, um, is there a way to scale it? Are we going to be replicating that in multiple places and testing it in context? And then all the way to delivering what we find most important is, are we testing? Are we measuring? Are we making sure that this is having an impact on a scale that matters? WF is really aligning ourselves to the global goals, the goals that the world says matters, sustainable development goals, those set you know, Aichi targets, um, those set in Paris. We're aligning our entire organization to holding ourselves accountable to those global goals. So is your idea over time going to be able to be scaled so that we can have impact at a scale that matters? So today you're focused on that first loop, right? You're going to take the opportunity with all the materials you've been given, all the experts in the room, to really say, do I understand the problem? Do I even know what's in front of me? This is massive, right? We have this, this, the scale of the issues are so profound, but I would challenge you to really look and see if you can find a discrete problem for someone or for some community that you can really help solve. 
you're gonna go through a discovery phase, right? Get outside yourself. Let go of your inner expert. It's fine to not know anything. It's actually great if you're coming from outside of the field that you're in because we need your beginner's mind to be able to look and say, hey, I don't understand this. Tell me more about that. But why is that happening? And once you think that you've heard that, ask them again. But no, 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 I don't really get it. Why? Why is that a problem? How does that feel to you? And then you're gonna put all of that up on the board, right? You're gonna have some time for synthesis and taking all those ideas and gathering those stories. And then, then you get to that concept, that wild idea, and have a chance to kind of rapidly prototype it. So I'm gonna focus just for a second on problem definition, mostly because we're all here for those great, sexy, wild ideas, right? But if you don't understand the problem and the issue that you're tackling, there will probably be issues. Now, while this is an extreme example, and Einstein was really thinking about five minutes on thinking about the solutions, not necessarily delivering or implementing them, I think it underscores what we've got to, to do today, which is spend some time understanding the issue in front of you, getting to know who's having those issues, and make sure that you're solving the right thing, not necessarily solving the thing right. Like I said, if you can get outside, if you can use the experts that are here today, if we can introduce you to someone real quick to see if we can answer something for you, do that. There aren't even analogous situations where you can say, okay, we're looking at reducing ivory demand. That's a desire. It's a desire for ivory. There's a cultural context to that. Talk to somebody else about what it feels like to have desire for something that they shouldn't have. Find a way to get at the root of that and how that feels. Um, and put yourselves in the place of those who are using the solution that you're devising. There's, we can help you with that because we might very well have been talking to folks, but even when you're putting things up on the board from what you've heard, just think about it in a way of what is that user gonna have to deal with? What will happen when you have to deal with rain and deluge and your vehicle doesn't have enough gas and all of those things? Put yourselves in their, in their shoes. And what I always love to think about is once you're in that abstract world and you've, you've got all this stuff in front of you and it's a real tangled mess, <coughs> is you can start to organize in clusters just a little bit around kind of what are some of those insights that are coming out. The second that you put a lot of ideas together up on the board of what you've heard other people say, not what came from your head, but what you heard other people say, and you're kind of clustering them together, is when you can start to say, oh, it seems like there's a need for X. It seems like there's a real opportunity here for us to solve this problem. And it's at that moment that you can begin um, devising just different areas of focus and start to drill in on some areas that you might um, take today. I'll just say that around this time is when you would come back and say, do we have the question that we're um, really supposed to be solving? Do we really understand it? Did I hear a lot from others and from our experts or for, from what I've researched that might change the question that we're working on? Give yourself a real check and say, um, how might we actually devise something that is actually going to be useful for someone? You know, we were talking yesterday about illuminated nets. We know that we have a current state which is illuminated nets save turtles, but yet they're, they're costly and they're time consuming. So how might we deliver an illuminated net that is more cost effective and um, still reduces the bycatch of turtles. How might we? It opens up a range of possibilities of who we might work with and who it is that we'll need to come together to inspire around a very specific problem. That's when you get to the wild idea. So you very well came in with one that you have fallen in love with, right? You already know these problems. You already have something that's really sexy and you can't wait to tell people about it. Fantastic, because you want those, right? That's what we're looking for today. But capture it, write it down, and then make sure that that solution actually fits the problem that you were hoping to solve, right? And then you get a chance to maybe prototype it. 
oftentimes this is misconceived as something that you're prototyping or you're building a 2D, 3D model of your entire proof of, of concept. Not necessarily. It may be that you're able to just get something in someone's hands and they can test just a component. Maybe it's just a single assumption that you have made about what someone might need or want or what it might feel like to do something. So break it into component parts and test just one part of it and test that assumption and see if it fails. We've done this in any number of ways. We've definitely done it. I was involved in the one with the plates. We did that in four hours. You know, you can just put a model in someone's hands. There's something about having something tangible in front of you that you can quickly react to. You know, you don't have to build the whole app, but you could certainly get your phone out and put a sticky note on it and say, this is what we were thinking. Does that work for you? Storyboard it, role play it. You're building a cook stove, put something together and put it out in front of them and say, is that, does that work for you? And ask them a little bit more about how would you use it. It's through that dialogue that you'll have with someone that you'll end up getting insights that you wouldn't have otherwise. So we're doing this right now. One of the showcases is that in the Northern Great Plains, we really care about the entire ecosystem. Um, prairie dogs are a key part of that. And we, they're, they're being threatened by a sylvatic plague. Black-footed ferrets, which we really care about, are really dependent on those burrows and on the prey for the prairie dogs. So we are using and prototyping right now both UAVs and ATVs to drop peanut butter pellets with vaccines out on the ground for these prairie dogs to eat so that they can be vaccinated against this plague to save endangered ferrets. How might we? This is happening right now. We're testing it. We're trying to see what works. We know that it's working. We know that the prairie dogs are having those vaccines. We're seeing the biomarkers but it's not perfected yet. We still are working on it, but we've got an end goal in mind. It's good he's cute since we're stuck on that, right? It's probably a really large image. Yeah, maybe. There we go. And we want you to go big, right? Go wild, go for quantity, go for things outside of the thinking. I remember when drones and UAVs on a sticky note was like the wild idea on the board. No longer wild, right? We're doing it. So get outside yourself, think of those big ideas, but having it grounded in that it's desired by someone, some community, is going to help you in making sure that there's a real need for it for when you go back and say, hey, is this viable? Does somebody really need this solution? Is there somebody who's gonna invest in this? Is it really feasible? Um, who am I gonna have to have to, to work with to get this done? And it's that sweet spot in the middle that's that potential solution that Yesco, I think we'll talk about more at lunch about what are some of the criteria we'll be looking for in, um, in all of your blueprints today. <coughs> so thanks so much. I'm really inspired by what you have. I can't wait to tell Rebecca Shaw, our chief scientist and our whole wildlife tech team, what you've come up with. Um, we'll be also tweeting tonight a little bit about this and we'll have folks live. So um, I would be inspired if you're the ones who are coming out with the ideas rather than those that are just on the West Coast. We need this. We all have to work together and we're really um, grateful that you're here today to spend time on it. You know that some of your resources are coming from wildlabs.net. We are just one of many conservation partners where we're crowdsourcing. Um, both conservation experts and then also putting people in touch with um, innovators. And so this is a great space to be able to take what you're doing today or work that you might end up engaging on our platform or take this forward because um, you have a real role in this. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Steve. That was brilliant. Thank you.